Hello and welcome back everyone we we online and today i'm going to continue the story what if naruto master to edit seal part 2 if you enjoyed this video please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload now wasting no more time let's begin during her quick walk she kept her eyes open and looked at every roof storefront and face in the crowd to see if she could find his red hair or purple eyes even though it was busy in the early morning she had no trouble getting through the crowds that split in front of her it wasn't smart to get in senjutsu in a day's way even worse she shouldn't have done it when she was as upset as she was at the time why the hell didn't anyone tell me he had been in the hospital for 2 weeks he must have been so scared and confused as he lay there all alone She knew that there wasn't really anyone to blame for what had happened. Few people knew she was back in Konoha, and she didn't think anyone else knew that Kushina had asked her to come back to check on Naruto's health. Still, he's an Uzumaki prince and the heir to the Namikaze name. Haruzen should have told me about it just to make sure his health and safety, let alone because he's my godson. That made her stop thinking. Did anyone know she was the godmother of the two children besides the Uzumaki Namikaze family and the three senen? Most likely not. It wouldn't have helped the kids to make themselves an even bigger target. They were already Uzu royalty and thought to be the children of the Yandame Hokage. They didn't need more people to know that they were close to the Sanen. Then we only have ourselves to blame. I should have asked about him right away. We could have avoided this mess if I had picked him up from the academy right away instead of putting it off. She had to wonder, though, why no one else had tried to take care of the boy while she was away, especially since they probably didn't know she was there to watch over him. Kirin I has always been close to the family. Haruzen is like a grandfather, and I know that Kakashi has always wanted a little brother. So why do I hear that Naruto has been on the streets? This makes no sense at all. The last Senju knew something wasn't right here, or maybe she just didn't have all the facts she should have. Either way, she was going to find out what was going on. No godson of hers was going to be found living on the streets, not when she had a whole empty compound and a Senju treasury that she could never empty on her own. Okay, so where does that woman live? Only Kirinai, the Jinjutsu mistress of Kano Hagakure, would know what's going on. She was like a daughter to Kushina, and if the Uzumaki woman had told anyone about Naruto's plans, it would have been her. When Kushina agreed to keep an eye on Naruto's health, Sunade regretted not asking her for more information. This wasn't the first time. With my luck, I should have known something would go wrong. If I had to guess though, I think Kushina would have left everything inside the compound where she thought it would be safest. Too bad that doesn't really help anyone at the moment. How the hell will anyone else get in if her own son can't? Sunade stopped in the middle of the street and looked up at the roofs until she saw an ANBU waving them down. They asked, "Yes, Sunade Sama. I want to know where Yuuhi Kurenai's house is. The neighborhood where Shinobi live. Her house is on top of apartment building 7." The ANBU paused, thinking, "I don't know how she got a house built on top of another building." Or why she would do that instead of buying and fixing up a house on the ground level? They said, shrugging their shoulders and trying to forget the thought. Sunade Sama, was there anything else? No, thank you for your help, he said. The ANBU nodded and went back to doing whatever they were supposed to do on the seventh apartment building. Ha! Huh, interesting. I wouldn't expect anything less from a skilled jounin who learned from Kushina, though. She and her husband were both able to train great shinobi, but they were both kind of strange. Kakashi was known to be a pervert. He kept to himself and wasn't seen much. He was always late, and that made him almost as well known as the ninjutsu he had stolen over the years. Word on the street was that the man always wore a mask, even when he was with a woman, because he was so private. No one knew if he even slept with women, but many women said they had spent the night with him. Most of them were regular people who said he had shown them his face. So they were probably not very reliable sources. On the other hand, Kirinai couldn't figure out what she was. She seemed cold and uncaring on the outside. When she left her house, she gave off a professional vibe. People who knew her, though, knew that she was a hopeless romantic who liked to read romance novels and daydream about meeting her own prince charming. She often criticized Kakashi for the books he read, but when she went home, she read books that were mostly the same but not as good. She didn't like perverts, but she could talk for hours about her sexual fantasies or her most recent wet dream. The two had been trained by two of Konoha's best shinobi, but they were weird as hell. On the other hand, most people who worked in this field long enough to become jounin were. They were just some of the most obvious cases. Then there was Guy, but that man was so strange that Sunade didn't even know where to start talking about him. Some things were better off on their own. When Sunade got to the area where Shinobi live, it was easy for her to find Building Seven. 
On the other hand, she had trouble figuring out how to get to Kiranai's front door. What the hell do I do to get up there? She doesn't really think that people will climb walls or jump off roofs to get to her house, does she? Tsunade just shook her head in disgust. This is such a silly way to do things. What would happen if a civilian was delivering something and her chakra was blocked or sealed? Even if Naruto tried to go to her for help, he wouldn't be able to get up there without Shinobi training, because the walls are so smooth. Tsunade put her foot on the building's wall to start her climb, but her chakra didn't stick to it. This made her angry. Apartment Building 7 is the safest place for Shinobi to live besides clan compounds. Of course, they would have ways to stop people from using chakra to stick to it. She looked around for a building close enough to the apartments that she could easily jump from. She couldn't find it. Are you effing kidding me? Not only do I have to climb up another building, but I also have to pump chakra out of my legs so I can jump across. It wouldn't be a small amount of chakra either. Tsunade didn't think there were any chunin who could get to Kiranai's front door. She glared at the house on top of the building, which was making fun of her, and walked to the next building. This is a load of crap. Senju fucking Tsunade was sitting on her couch in her house with her, and she did not look happy. This is probably about Naruto-kun. But that glare looks a little too angry for him to be the cause. I usually get a look that says, what's wrong with your house? No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't help but let out a small laugh. With a sly smile, she thought she might as well take this rare chance to tease the best doctor in the world. You know, Tsunade-sama, the apartment staircase leads to the roof. If anything, this piece of information made the powerful woman even more angry. That would have been nice to know, said the Senju, making a note in his head to find the ANBU who forgot to tell him that. It's well known among shinobi, she added in a whisper, and at cheap restaurants that deliver to civilians. But I doubt you came here to see my unique housing. You're right, I didn't, Tsunade said with a nod. I came here because I recently found out something that surprised me a lot. The Jinjutsu mistress of Kanoha started to feel like she was about to die. As her body went numb, her stomach knotted up. She could feel beads of sweat forming on her forehead, and she had to force herself to breathe normally. She asked, and what could that be, Tsunade-sama? With her hands shaking, SHT, this has to be about Naruto-kun. Why couldn't I be wrong just this once? Oh, it just seems like my godson has been living on the streets, even though both his mother's and father's students are here in Kanoha. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you, Kiranai? She was keeping herself under control so well that you almost couldn't tell how angry she was. Kiranai knew how angry the woman in front of her was, which was a bad thing. I had heard that the compound had turned him down, said the woman with red eyes. But the last time I saw him was about a month ago, a week before Kushina Sensei left. And you haven't gone looking for him. If I went looking for him, and he came here for help, who would help him? I've been here, ready to help him the second he comes to me. Okay, that was a lie. She had gone out to take care of things plenty of times, but she knew she was one of Naruto's last options, and with so many people in the village, she wasn't going to hear him ask for help anytime soon. Is it true? Tsunade's accusations were starting to make Kiranai angry. When Naruto-kun was sick in the hospital, where was she, the best doctor in the world? Why was she talking to her when she could be helping the boy who would accept her much more easily than he would accept her? Why did she just find out about these things now? When Kushina had told her that Tsunade was coming to check on the health of her son, how dare she try to take all the blame for what happened? He wasn't her fault. And when, exactly, was the last time you saw him, Tsunade-sama? His birth. His second birthday party. The hospital where he was lying confused and alone. On the street. Safe in your own home. He doesn't even know you, but you were supposed to keep an eye on his health, said Kiranai. Well, how's his health? Is he okay? You wouldn't even know. Don't try to make me look bad. At least he knows who I am and where to find me. Then why hasn't he? Kiranai was embarrassed and looked down at the floor. Our relationship isn't very good. We get along because of Kushina Sensei, but we don't really like being around each other. Ha, huh? said Tsunade in a triumphant tone. You say you're here for him, but you know he'll never come. He might as well be alone. Kiranai replied, he might as well be with his godmother, who is in charge of his well-being. I didn't find out until last night. But why didn't you? You should have seen him on your first day back, not almost three weeks later. Kushina gave him instructions, you know. I was a day late, so he would have come to me after the academy the next day. I was waiting for him to come to me. Pure and I gave a snort. And when he didn't show up, you didn't think anything was wrong. I don't believe that for a second. I thought someone else was taking care of him and that they would bring him to me for checkups. So you just thought the best and didn't check, even though checking was the only reason you came back. 
Hey, I was supposed to check up on him, not be his mother. Aren't you supposed to be like his older sister? You should have gone to help him, even if it made you feel uncomfortable. I agreed, defended Kiranai, to help him if he needed it. He hasn't asked for help yet, so it's clear he doesn't. Quite, Tsunade said in a dry way. From what I've heard, he's been doing well as a thief in Konoha. I'm sure Kushina would be proud of how little help he needed from her oldest daughter when it came to risking a nice meeting with the Uchiha police force to get his next meal. But here you are trying to put all the blame on me, even though he's still out there and you could be taking care of him. I'm not here to take care of him. I'm here to make sure his chakra coils develop properly now that he's separated from the Kyuubai's remaining chakra in Kushina, and the chakra Naruko seal is mixing with her own. You should be taking care of him, not me. Furunai cocked her head. B. Not Kakashi. Not Kushina's father figure Haruzen. Not her best friend Mikoto. Not, I don't know, his fucking godmother. Tsunade took a deep breath to calm herself down and try to stop her temper from getting worse. Now was not the time to point fingers. Now was the time to figure out who was to blame. Listen, Kurenai. I'm here to help him, but I can't care for him. He knows you, even if your relationship with him is tense. He's much more likely to trust you than me. No, you don't know anything about it. He should trust an Iwashinobi instead. I see. But he might as well think I'm an Iwashinobi for all he cares. Tsunade, you need to understand that there's a reason why we don't get along well. It's not him, it's me and my past. I'm not going to tell you why. But you have to trust me that you are the best choice for him right now. Pure and I, I'm not here to be the boy's mother, but this is a great chance for you, his sister, to start making up for the distance between you and him. Just because I see Kushina as my mother and she sees me as her daughter doesn't mean I see him as my brother or that he sees me as his sister. You mean you don't think of him as your brother? Here and I looked at the floor and thought about something. No, that isn't it. I do think of him as my little brother, but I just can't be his big sister. You are most likely to get into his life. It doesn't have to be all the time. But if you could just give him a spare room in the Senju compound, we'd both know he was safe. Tsunade gave it a minute of thought before agreeing. That could work, she said but he would still need someone to guide him all the time. There you are, Kiranai said quickly, seeing Tsunade's angry look. And your student. If you can convince him, he can always come to me. I might not be able to go to him, but I won't turn him away. That could work. You'd be like a mentor instead of a caretaker, and I'd be more like a landlady. This sounds good. I'll keep an eye out for the brat and ask the old monkey what he knows. Just remember, medic or not, I'm sending him to you if he asks about the birds and the bees. Kiranai got red in the face. But she nodded as Tsunade got up and walked toward the door. Make sure you keep your eyes open, too, Kiranai. If you see him, send him my way or tell me where you saw him. We can't help the boy until we find him. Yes, I will, Kiranai said as the door closed. Now that they had a plan, things would be fine. Sad for Naruto, their plan didn't help him at all now. Until they could put it into action, it wouldn't help him find his next meal, give him direction, or protect him from the cold. He was still by himself, with no one but himself to care for him. He didn't know what the two women were planning, and if he had, he wouldn't have been able to accept what seemed like pity. He would have to make it on his own in this new life that was thrust upon him. Still, he might not have been as alone as he thought. Senpai, the ANBU agent said, but a raised hand cut him off. Don't worry about it, it will be taken care of, his boss told him. The ANBU seemed hesitant and uncertain, but he nodded to show that he agreed with his boss. Okay, and you senpai, we'll leave this in your capable hands, he said, and he and the rest of his squad left. Hade Kakashi, a student of the Yondame Hokage, stayed behind to keep an eye on the streets. But he wasn't really watching the streets, he was watching a single person on them. Kakashi watched as they pulled into a nearby alley and dumped their most recent stolen coin purses into their cargo pants. They then climbed a wall to look for their next victims. Kakashi couldn't help but smile behind his mask. He's getting so big so quickly, sensei. I'm sure you'd be proud of his skills. Now, if only he was smart enough that he didn't need someone to keep the police away from him. All in good time, I suppose. He's already gotten away from me a few times, so it shouldn't be long before he can do this without me. He had been watching Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, the son of his sensei, for almost a week. He was pretty impressed, if he was honest with himself. The child wasn't particularly talented, but he learned and fixed his mistakes at an amazing rate, which made it easy for him to get used to where he was. Now, being homeless wasn't what Kakashi had in mind for his sensei's son, but at the very least, it was teaching Naruto how to take care of himself. Because of this, Kakashi didn't try to help the boy directly. Instead, he took care of him and took care of things out of the boy's sight. Kakashi kept the police away from the boy and made sure he went to the academy. He was also the one who took care of Naruto's first kill. 
That was the thing Kakashi was most proud of. This boy was going to be a nice change from the last few generations of Konohagakure Shinobi because he had killed so young and was already using stealth like a real Shinobi. It was a little disappointing that it was his only kill so far, but it was probably for the best. At the end of the day, everyone in Konohagakure was a citizen of Fire Country, no matter what they did. Naruto and Kakashi were both lucky that no one had tried to find out what had happened to them. The man didn't have any family, and the few friends he did have all thought he had done something wrong and gotten in over his head, so he ran away to a nearby country for safety. Though, looking into the death wouldn't have gotten them very far, since Kakashi had already burned the body and cleaned the alleyway of both the man's and Naruto's blood. God's Catton helped him with his job. Fire was the only thing that could make things go more smoothly. Shaking his head to get rid of these ideas, he turned his attention back to Naruto who had again stolen a coin purse from a person who didn't know what was going on. You know, if this keeps up, someone is going to tell the council about all this theft soon. He should really take a break for a while and make everyone think he was just a visitor who had already gone home. Kakashi shrugged as he carefully thought about what to do next. No matter what, the worst thing that could happen is that Naruto would be more careful, which was a good thing in his eyes. Ah, screw it. The child wins both ways. When he only thought about the boy, he started to see him as food. The boy stopped moving right away because his instincts told him there was a dangerous animal nearby. It only took the child a minute to find the person who was after him, but it must have felt like hours to him. Again, Kakashi was impressed. He looked into the child's eyes, though his own were hidden by his mask, and pointed to a low roof between them. When Naruto got the message, he gave a single nod and went in that direction. On the other hand, Kakashi took his time. Naruto seemed a little tense, like he was ready to run away and he was slowly spinning a kunai in one hand, but other than that, he seemed pretty calm. There was no fear, but there was caution. There was no hate or malice, but there was frustration, which was probably directed at himself. When Kakashi got to the roof, he didn't talk to the young man. Instead, he stood tall and still and looked at him closely. Even though he was tense, Naruto looked back at him with his shoulders apart and his back straight. The boy took off his dirty brown hood and looked with pride into the dog mask's empty eye holes. Even when he was fighting someone much stronger than him, he wouldn't give up. Kakashi knew that the boy was not being arrogant or even okay with the fact that he was going to die soon. Instead, he was just proud. The only time someone was weak was when they thought their opponent was too strong to fight. If he backed down in front of the porcelain tooth, he would be admitting weakness and defeat, which was not acceptable for a boy like him who had been through a lot. He was exactly like his dad. Kakashi kept quiet for a few more seconds before he spoke. You're a pretty good kid, but just as you raise yourself higher than your targets, both the ANBU and the Uchiha police force like to travel by roof, which is higher than you. In the future, I suggest keeping a closer eye on your surroundings. Naruto nodded to show that he agreed with the advice. He put away his kunai and took out a bag of coins. Kakashi took the bag without saying a word when it was thrown to him. He had seen Naruto do the same thing with Tsunade's apprentice. You know, I don't mind if you practice on the people of Kanoha, but if you keep doing this, people will start to get suspicious. You need to find another way to make money. Thank you, and you san for your advice. The boy looked at a watch, which Kakashi saw was quite expensive. Huh? He seems to be a little better than I thought. It was easy to cut off the coin purses that many people in Kanoha wore around their waists, but it was much harder to take someone's watch without them noticing. Naruto looked at the time and then turned his attention back to the ANBU in front of him. I got permission from Sarutobai-sama to help his clan take care of Kano Hagakure's training grounds and the surrounding forests. I should be able to sell any equipment I find for a good price as used or scrap. It won't be a lot, but depending on how wasteful our shinobi are, I may be able to make a decent living while I'm in the academy. Kakashi nodded slowly. It was a good idea, especially since the Hakage gave his approval, and the dog-faced ANBU knew how wasteful his friends were. Since they had been doing well for a long time, they took the well-paying jobs and abundance of tools for granted. When he was young, there wasn't much equipment, and you were lucky if you went into battle with a full holster of kunai. Even back then, if a kunai got stuck in your skin, it was a good thing if it hit somewhere non-lethal. Free kunai were good kunai, after all. Good, then you should focus on that and only cut purses when the fields run dry. Give them time to get new weapons and all that. Now, isn't it about time you made your way to the academy? Lunch ended about an hour ago, and if you don't get there soon you'll miss the practical lessons. The boy put his hood over his head, gave him a sharp nod, and then jumped over the side of the roof in one smooth move. You know, little thief, that did look kind of cool. 
If you're not careful, you might get your own fangirls, especially if you grow up to look exactly like your parents. After all, they were two very good-looking shinobi. Kakashi was about to leave when he saw a beautiful woman in her early 20s grab Naruto's arm and take off his hood. He was interested, so he watched as she hugged the boy and then put her arms around his and pulled him to a nearby cafe. Well, it looks like I talked too soon. It looks like you've already got a fangirl, and she's an older woman. Well done, little thief. Your father is probably grinning from ear to ear right now. Kakashi gave one last smirk and went back to his patrol, leaving Naruto with the pretty little prostitute who seemed to know the boy. The kid had been working hard, so this break would be nice. It's crazy that he hasn't even met Jiraiya yet. He cursed himself in silence. How could he be so stupid as to forget about the people who were on top of him? He was a hunter, but in this village he was also a victim. It was a shame that they forgot such a simple fact. It was good that the ANBU didn't think it was necessary to arrest him and was instead willing to give him advice. Naruto had always known that there were people on the roofs, but he had been so sure that the people traveling above him didn't know he was there that he had forgotten that anyone else would find him suspicious if they saw him sitting on the lower roofs. Even so, those directly above him would still be able to see him every time he went after a target. He thought that the crowds he worked in would keep people from looking at him, but it looks like he was wrong. That dog, though, he was tough. There was no doubt about the ANBU's skill. Naruto could feel the shinobi's power and confidence leaving them. That man had been through a lot, but he came back stronger than he had been before. But if that was the kind of person who had caught him, he would just have to beat them. The dog worked alone on its master's words, so he would have to be above the dog and not of a master. I need to be a wolf, he said. The wolf was big, proud, and didn't care what anyone thought. It stalked through the forest, looked for food, and killed it with ruthless accuracy. But he couldn't succeed as a lone wolf, because wolves are strong as a group. He could be as strong as he wanted without a pack, but he would never be as good as he could be. I have to look for a pack. Before he could figure out what was going on, he felt a hand grab his cloak and pull his hood off. He had just enough time to figure out who they were before he attacked. Tatsuki, as she started dragging him to a nearby cafe, her green eyes sparkled with amusement and mischief. She smiled at him and wrapped her arms around his right arm. You didn't really think you could hide from me, did you, Naruto-kun? He gave a quick look back to where the dog-faced ANBU had been. When he saw him leave, he looked back at the woman who seemed determined to take him. Not at all, Tatsuki-san. Did you need my help with something? Nope, the woman said with a smile. It looked like she didn't care about anything right now. Naruto looked at his watch and gave her a curious look. He asked, shouldn't you be working right now? She showed him her tongue. You should be at the school, right? I would be. But it looks like I'm going to be taken instead. Why did you decide to do that? She gave him a small pout. I've made enough money for today and can't do anything else. Are you saying you're just bored? Naruto sighed and said, yep. Why did he have to be the one who was grown up? You're pretty childish, you know. Tatsuki replied, and you're too damn stiff. Loosen up a bit and have some fun. If you mean what I think you mean, you should already know what my answer is. I'll pay when I'm ready. Oh, don't be a jerk. You should know that I don't like having debts hanging over my head. They tend to bite you in the behind. He asked, your debt is to an eight-year-old. How will that hurt you? And it's been, what, a week? I won't be ready for such activities for probably years. Oh, so you're saying that an eight-year-old boy wouldn't be interested in me. And now you sound like a pedophile, she said. He rubbed the bridge of his nose with his left hand. Sometimes I feel like my age is more of a curse than a blessing. Okay, Mr. Responsible, you can pay for lunch. Exhibit A. She made another pouty face at him. Oh, don't be like that. Would it help if I called you Tu San or Tu Sama? I swear I'll have gray hairs before I turn 13. She let out a laugh. Don't worry about it. It will make you look more royal, and people will only think you're short, not young. Tatsuki-san, I'm having second thoughts about having lunch with you. The woman whined, no, that won't do. You need to call me darling or princess or something, or I'll start crying. You don't want me to start crying, do you, daddy? I like your flirty side better. This childish side, while fitting, doesn't really suit you, Tatsuki-san. She gave him a look but didn't say anything. They stopped walking and just stood in the street. After a few seconds of silence, he broke down and asked, what? Nothing has changed. He let out a long sigh. Tatsuki Haim, you shouldn't act like a child like this, she said. Her eyes lit up with joy, and she gave him the biggest smile he had ever seen. She picked him up and gave him a hug. Then she spun him around once and patted the top of his head. Good boy, Naruto-kun. That wasn't too hard, was it? I'm not sure if you're worth all this trouble. Do you think we could renegotiate so that I paid for you to stay away? He hit him on the head as she smiled seductively. Oh, it's too late to go back now. 
You need to be a man and finish what you started. Plus, she paused to show her figure, it's too late to go back. When you finally take what's yours, you'll know how much I'm worth. She turned to him, but he was looking through his hair. She asked with her hands on her hips, what are you doing? I'm looking for my first gray hair, was his calm answer. Why? Oh, I found it. He pulled out a single gray hair from his head and showed it to her with pride. I hope you're happy, Tatsuki-san, because I won't make it to 20 at this rate. WH what? But how why when? The poor girl was confused, and Naruto couldn't help but laugh at her confusion. It wasn't really his hair, but one from the ANBU agent he had just talked to. It had fallen off the taller man and landed on his own red nest of hair by accident. He wouldn't say that, though, to Tatsuki. Okay, now that we know I'm going to die because of you, let's go get something to eat. She just followed him around, still trying to figure out if she was really giving the boy gray hairs. He said, come on, keep up. I'm paying. She sped up right away to keep up with him. Tatsuki never said no to a free meal, especially if it meant she could hang out with her little friend. She had been alone for a lot of her life, so it was nice to have someone to talk to again. He wasn't trying to get something out of her, he didn't ask about her past, and he didn't seem to judge her job. She was finally able to let go and be herself around this little boy, and she was grateful for that. Wait, I'm wearing heels. He just laughed and stopped so she could catch up and put one arm around his. Is this what it's like to have a friend? When he saw her smile, he couldn't help but smile back. He felt warm and happy all over. I like it. Tatsuki was his first friend, so no matter how strong he got or where his life took him, he would always have a special place in his heart and mind. He couldn't think of anyone better for the job than the young woman on his arm, who was acting like a child. Deep inside a seal, two red eyes grew smaller. Sand, more sand, and more sand still. Naruko sighed and looked out over the horizon. This is a stupid place. The name Land of Wind was good, but barren wasteland of nothingness and sandy irritation might have been a better choice. As the wind tried again to take off her hood and play with her long blonde hair, she turned to watch her mother get instructions from the ship's captain. Instead of going through Suna and crossing most of Kei's no Kuni, the two Yuzumaki women headed north from the fire capital and hired a ship to take them to a port in the far northwest corner of Kei's no Kuni, so that the desert's natural defenses wouldn't be lost. Wind Country's capital wasn't a port city. Instead, it was two days' walk from Sandfish City, which had the largest port. On the other hand, it would have taken them about a month and a half to get to the capital any other way. The distance should have only taken half that long. But constant sandstorms and intense heat made it take twice as long as it should have. Naruko shook the sand out of her shoes as her mother came up behind her. Her mother looked as at home as if they were back in Kanoha. The little girl didn't know how her mother could be so calm in such a terrible place. Please tell me that we're borrowing horses or something. Naruko didn't like how happy her mother was when she said nope. Great, the girl moaned. She already knew that this was going to be awful. That's my girl, always looking on the bright side. Kushina heard the sarcasm, but she chose to ignore it as she did most things that made her feel bad. They were going on a trip, and they were going to enjoy it as much as they could. Yeah, optimism, yippee. Due to an unexpected sandstorm, it took them three days to get to the capital, but they got there safe and sound, if not a little grumpy. I swear, once we leave here, I'll never want to see this damn sand again, Naruko said. Her mother hit her on the head while trying to keep a smile on her face. Language, honey, said the man to the woman. So, where did that door go? Naruko took her time to look up and see where they were at last. She was a little upset. There was a big ring of mud in front of them that went in both directions until it disappeared into the horizon. The top of this mud wall seemed to curve back on itself, as if to discourage people from trying to climb it. But Naruko had a feeling there was more to it than that. Her mother proudly pointed to a small smudge in the distance and said, Ah, there it is. That storm must have thrown us off course. As the minutes turned into hours, Naruko realized that the smudge was actually two rectangle-shaped walls growing next to the mud ring. But it was hard to see the two walls because sand had built up on either side, probably because of that recent storm. The two women were lucky that the big pile of sand stood out enough to catch their attention. Between the two walls, not many people were trying to get into the city, so the two moved quickly through the mud ring. Naruko stopped when she saw it. She had made up her mind way too quickly. Painstakingly carved out of sandstone, the city must have been miles long and spread out below her. All of the walls were smoothed out and had great pictures of the Land of Wind's history carved into them. As far as she could see, big bridges stretched out from what seemed like random places to connect every part of the city. The palace stood right in the middle. The Emerald Obelisk lived up to its name. 
It was a huge, jade green tower that rose from the dark center of the city. On the tower, gold and silver vines grew, and every so often, they bloomed into large ivory flowers that stood tall in the desert sun. Naruko couldn't say anything. It's great, isn't it? Asked the boy. The girl could only nod. Fushina laughed and smacked her on the back. Well, come on, we can see the sights tomorrow. For now, let's get some more weather-appropriate clothes and find a good place to sleep. Naruko had been following her mother for a few minutes when she had an idea you know, Ka-chan. When we go back to Kanoha we'll have to bring a whole new wardrobe with us. But why is that? Well, I don't know about my clothes, but I think a lot of yours have gone missing since Juria has been in the house. Kushina laughed out loud with a bark. She paused to ruffle the girl's hair and said, Yeah, that sounds like something he would do. Don't worry, though. Ka-chan planned ahead and changed the seals so that only the clan leader can open them. And Nai Kun too, right? That's right. Remember when I hugged him while he was eating breakfast? Yeah, that was right before your food caught fire. Kushina made an angry face at Naruko when she thought about the mistake. Yes, well, while I was hugging him, I used a seal to copy his chakra signature to add to the sealing matrix. So, did you do that before or after trying to burn down the house? Why, you little brat? Naruko put up her hands to show that she was giving up. Kushina sighed and put her arms across her chest. You know as well as I do that it had to be after. First I got the signature, then I saved my breakfast, and then we both wished your brother a good first day of school. Then we got our stuff and went to wait for that Tsunade woman you told me about, Naruko said. Right, said Kushina as he turned away. Her daughter's next words made her world freeze. When did you add Nikon to the Matrix? Kushina's stomach felt like it was knotted up a million times, and her heart jumped into her throat. She felt cold despair and helplessness, and a blanket of shadow wrapped around her, threatening to drown her as it pulled her down into an endless abyss. She fell to her knees on the sandstone walkway because her legs could no longer hold her up. She mumbled, no, 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 trying very hard to convince herself it wasn't true. I must have added him, because I know I did. When did I add him? He couldn't get in if he wasn't added. If he couldn't get in, he couldn't find out what to do from her. If he couldn't get in, he couldn't get to what she had left for him. If he couldn't get in, he'd never get her letter. Despair turned into numbness, which was quickly replaced by a sense of urgency that she hadn't felt since the Qubai broke out of her seal. No, this wasn't the time to get scared. Tsunade was there. Hiranai was in Konoha. Haruzen, Mikoto, and Kakashi were in Konoha. She had to be sure, though. She had to know that he was okay and that someone was taking care of him. Everyone should have had a general idea of what was going on, and that should have been enough for her son to know that she hadn't left him. She would come back, but not until he was ready. Not until she knew he wouldn't get hurt. She jumped to her feet and grabbed Naruko's arm. Then she started to run. Where are we going, Kachan? We need to talk to Haruzen right away. The two hurried to the post office, but it didn't make much of a difference. Due to sandstorms, it would take at least a week for a bird to carry a letter from the Kays no Kuni deserts to Hai no Kuni, and it would take twice as long to send the letter by boat to the fire capital. The two women would spend the next two weeks in the beautiful capital of Kays no Kuni, but neither of them would be able to enjoy it because they were both thinking about Naruto Uzumaki and what was going on with him. At the end of those two weeks, they would get a short, to the point answer from the Sandame Hokage but it wouldn't do much to make them feel better. Still, they would keep going because they were determined to finish this trip. They would leave Naruto in the care of the people in Konohagakure. It might not have been their best choice. Inside the seal, two red lips parted to make a pearly white smile. After a long day of working, training, and dealing with Tatsuki, it felt great when his dirty clothes melted off and were replaced by a midnight black suit that was clean and crisp. As he walked down the narrow black marble path, he enjoyed the simple pleasure of hearing his shoes click on the newly waxed floor. Soft green light lit his way, making shadows dance to the sound of a breeze that wasn't there. When he got to the big dark wood doors, he didn't hesitate. He walked through them as soon as they opened for him, and they closed quietly behind the person in charge of this realm. He sat down at the empty table and waited for the person who lived in this world to join him. She did it in less than a minute. She went down the left staircase, dragging her long red dress behind her. She looked surprised to see him there, but that didn't stop her ruby lips from smirking. She walked over to her own seat, leaned back, and raised one brow. She finally spoke after a moment. What do you explain? I don't know much about Biju, he said, but this is what we humans call an evening meal. As he spoke, two plates with seasoned rabbit on rice and sautéed vegetables appeared. It wasn't anything special or hard, but it was important because she hadn't eaten since before she was sealed inside Yuzumaki Mido. Oh, she tried to hide her surprise and happiness, but the young man could tell. 
What do you have to go with this meal? He almost looked sorry as he shook his head. Unfortunately, I still can't give you drinks that suit your tastes better. One of these days, I'll have to find something better so we can have a proper meal. As he spoke, a glass appeared in her hand and started to fill itself. I'm going to have apple juice tonight. She smiled. It seemed like such a childish drink choice, but he was just a child. It was way too easy to forget how old he really was. Warden, I'm sure it will go well with dinner tonight. He smiled at her. I certainly hope so, because I didn't know what to say. You know, she said with a smirk as she drank some of her juice. Sometimes it's best not to say anything and just act like good things happened on purpose. That's good advice, Mido. I'll try to keep it in mind. Make sure you do that, young warden, because being quiet can get you far in life, especially in your job. With that, they stopped talking so they could enjoy their dinner. Even though they hadn't talked much before, they were comfortable with each other. It was just two people enjoying the fact that they weren't alone. Even though Naruto hadn't been around many people lately, he still wanted to be with them. He wasn't used to being alone and would much rather talk to a living thing than think about himself. When he was with other people, he could forget about the annoying questions and doubts that still bothered him. This made simple things, like having lunch with Tatsuki, something he looked forward to. Maido, on the other hand, had been alone for a long time. She could get the occasional glimpse of the outside world from her hosts or hear stray thoughts, but that was all second-hand information. This was the first meal she had shared with someone in a very long time, and she was having a great time. Maido decided to start talking after they had both finished eating and were sipping their drinks slowly. So, I could tell you were pretty happy earlier, dear warden, she said. I think there was something about a girl named Tatsuki, am I right? Maido made a sad face when she saw that Naruto was on guard right away. Yes, that's right, Fox, what's up with that? When he called her Fox, she winced and hoped she hadn't undone all of her hard work so easily. She tried to reassure him, I was just interested, dear warden. Unlike with your sister, I can't see your memories or always hear your thoughts. I can only get a glimpse into the mind of my warden when you're feeling strong emotions. So, when I felt happiness and heard the name Tatsuki at the same time, I was curious about who this girl might be. She must be special. She is the first person I can call a friend, and I was glad to be able to say that, Mido said. Mido hummed in agreement, but she didn't seem happy as she leaned back in her chair. Oh, I see. She must be very interesting for you to notice her. Naruto admitted, she is definitely different. But I like being with her. Mido gave a forced smile and said, of course. It's important to spend time with people we like. Naruto nodded. I quite agree. A strange silence fell over the two of them until Naruto finally broke it. Tell me, Mido, he said, looking into her eyes. Were you close to anyone before you were locked up? She seemed a little taken aback by the question, but she soon got back on track. Well, no, I don't think I did. The Biju kind of had a father, but we weren't close to him. I did spend a lot of time in a human form similar to what you see now, but I mostly kept to myself even then. Too bad, he said in a serious tone. Everyone needs a pack. She thought that the boy would do well with a pack. As he tried to stay alive on the streets of Konoha, he was, after all, a lot like a herd animal. But if he did have a pack, he could probably go a long way. She would be interested to see what would happen to such a group. It should be kind of funny. That's right, Warden. Do you want to start a pack with this Tatsuki? He blushed a lot, which told her he hadn't even thought about doing that before. Oh, I didn't know that. You seemed so happy with her that I thought you might have at least thought about making her your mate. She made him blush even more as she smiled. He said, well, I guess I did. I'll have to, uh, use her services at some point. Services? Asked the Kyuubai. Yes, she's a prostitute, Mido said, and they both started laughing. Oh, did the prostitute steal the heart of the Yuzumaki prince? That sounds like the plot of a forbidden love story. It's a little more complicated than that, thank goodness. I killed the guy who was going to be her client, and she wouldn't take any of the money he had on him until she earned it. What happened then? I, uh, offered to pay her ahead of time so that, uh, when I'm ready, we can call it even. Well, that's an interesting story, little warden. I want to know how it turns out. Yeah, me too, honestly. I don't know if I'll ever be able to let her spend the night with me. She was my first friend, and I'm not sure I could use her like that. I'm sure you'll figure something out, she told him. Now, I think it's time for you to get some rest. You do have to get up for the academy in the morning, don't you? He nodded at her. Yes, I do. Then, Mido, I'll see you tomorrow evening. He stood up, walked to the big doors behind him, and went back into the darkness of the seal. He would come back to eat with his ward tomorrow, the next day, and every day after that. He was in charge of her, after all. As he took off his favorite pipe and put it on his desk next to his hat, he let out a deep breath of smoke. It looks like locking him out wasn't part of the plan. 
He knew that. But how could she have forgotten to add her son to the Matrix? That was really bad. Haruzan rubbed the bridge of his nose and looked at the letter again. It was clear that she had written it quickly because many of the questions and requests were repeated more than once. It was almost like Kushina was in the room with her, trying to talk while she cried her eyes out. He quickly grabbed a spare piece of parchment and wrote down his answer, which answered what he thought were her most important questions. If he didn't give her a full explanation, she might be forced to come back. He had never agreed with her plan, because it was too easy for things to go wrong. She thought he was just being negative and paranoid, but new information showed that she was wrong. Kushina, he wrote, We know that the clan compound doesn't like Naruto because it put up its defenses against him almost a month ago. He has fully recovered from his injuries. Tsunade did indeed return to the village and was here when the compound rejected him. He continues, To the best of my knowledge, attending the academy, I do not know the extent of your plans for his care in your absence, and would recommend your immediate return to sort out everything else. Signing and dating the letter, he sent it back to the capital of Keiz no Kuni, hoping that Kushina would see reason and return for his son. A week later, his hopes would be proven empty as her reply informed him that she trusted the plans she had in place and knew she wouldn't be able to leave again should she return. They would be continuing with their trip. Giving a sigh, Haruzan would toss the letter into one of his desk drawers and hope that Kushina's preparations were as good as she believed them to be, because it wasn't as if things hadn't gone wrong already. Aruka grinned as he looked at the graded test in his hands. He had been right about that kid, he was a damn fast learner. Considering the fact that he was only here for parts of class and observed the rest from the tree outside, it was rather impressive that he had scored full marks on his tests over the past two weeks. He had been concerned, of course, about the student who never entered the building, but those fears were put to rest when, on the day of the test, he had climbed up to the second-story window and slipped into an empty seat without any of his classmates noticing. The civilian who was sitting next to him nearly had a heart attack when he finally noticed him. Naturally, he had left once his test was done, but he had received full marks. The boy must have had some really good eyesight to see and understand what he wrote on the board from that distance or Uruka really was as loud as people told him he was. He really hopped it was the former. The boy had come through again when it came to practical exams, quickly demonstrating the required technique and knowledge before disappearing to go do whatever it was he did. Unfortunately, his full marks and exams were countered by his lack of actual attendance and his refusal to appear for any of the quizzes. It was almost as if the boy didn't really care about schooling and only participated as much as he did to confirm he understood what he needed to be a shinobi. It reminded Aruka of back during the Third Shinobi War, when students were taught only what was deemed necessary to their survival and success before being shipped off to kill and die in the name of Konohagakure. No one cared what you scored on your quiz or how many days you may have missed, they just wanted to see that you knew what you were doing. Naruto seemed to know what he was doing. And so, one could possibly say that Aruka had taken upon himself a third Shinobi War mentality with the boy, allowing him to pass so long as he proved himself capable through the various examinations they had. He would be the lowest mark, of course, but at this point, he doubted the boy cared. Go on, Naruto, show them all what it is to be a Shinobi. I look forward to seeing just how far you'll go. She breathed deeply the multitude of heavenly spices that saturated the small stand as she took a stool idly scanning the large menu board posted behind the counter for a picture that looked the most appetizing. Welcome to Ikaraku's, what can I get for you today? Asked the waitress, a pretty young brunette that seemed rather happy to be able to interact with a customer. The stand had been empty despite the wonderful aroma that wafted from it. The poor girl must have been terribly bored. Whatever you recommend, I can't decide. Came the answer. Her thoughts were far away from ordering lunch, focused instead on her master's odd behavior. All right, I'll have that right out for you. The girl gave a quick bow before retreating into the back of the stall, leaving Shizune alone with her thoughts. What's gotten into you, Tsunade-sama? She wondered. A week ago she had told the woman of the little thief she had seen and the woman went into a panic. The following morning she had stormed out of the house as if hell itself was on her heels. She returned later that day looking no more at ease than she had been upon her departure, and immediately tried to squeeze every drop of information concerning the little thief from her apprentice. Shizune still didn't know what it was about the boy that had her master so upset and Tsunade refused to tell her. Of course, if Tsunade wouldn't tell her, maybe the little thief would be able to shed some light on the subject for her. Someone else entered the stall, sitting a stool away to her left. Looking at them through the corner of her eye, she found a grin make its way upon her face. Speak of the devil and he shall appear. He was covered in his brown cloak like usual, but made no effort to return the red hair that was trying to escape back into the confines of his hood. 
his purple eyes locked with hers for only a moment before going to the menu board. Oh, welcome to Ikaraku Ramen. I hope you haven't been waiting too long. The waitress was back, setting down Shizune's food with a quick enjoy before turning her attention fully to her newest customer. I've only just arrived, your timing is impeccable. His voice was rather bland, taking away from what the two women assumed to have been meant as a compliment. Ah, is that how his voice sounds? If I hadn't heard the rumors I'd assume he's just short, not a child who hasn't reached his teens. Still, to talk like that when he's supposed to be so young is impressive, if not a bit off-putting. It's like talking to an adult trapped within the body of a child. I see. The waitress seemed a bit nervous at this point, and as she kept talking it was easy for Shizun to figure out why. Well, I'm sorry to have to ask you this really, I am but you do have money, don't you? It's not like I think you might be trying to eat and run but with your, um, appearance and all. The unfortunate girl was stopped from her rambling as he sat a pouch of coins on the counter and pushed them over to her. I understand completely and take no offense, he said, his voice still even and dull. I'll take the Uzumaki special. The Uzumaki special, asked the waitress, surprised that he even knew of that particular unlisted menu item. Are you sure? It's rather large and pretty pricey. He waved off her concern. I am familiar with the dish, thank you. So, he's got some sort of connection to the Yuzumaki. Could it be as easy as him being an Yuzumaki prince? It would make sense, I guess. But the last Yuzumaki I knew of was Yuzumaki Kashina. It couldn't be her son, could it? Lost in thought as she was, Shizune didn't realize she was staring at the boy. He, however, was well aware. Is there something I can help you with? Broke her out of her thoughts, causing her to blush in slight embarrassment. Ah, uh, sorry, I was lost in my thoughts. She paused. This was a good an opportunity as any to sate her curiosity. Um, if it's not too much trouble, do you think you would be willing to answer some questions I have? She could barely make out the brow that rose within the confines of his hood. I do not see any harm in you asking. Well, it's just that I mentioned running into you, and the rumors that have been going around about you, to my master. Once I told her about your hair and eyes she seemed rather distraught. I asked her about it, but she won't tell me. I was hoping you might be able to tell me about your connection to my master. I have very few connections outside my immediate family, and even those are rather strained at the moment. What is the name of your master? Senju Tsunade. The slug Sanon. He sounded just as confused as she was. I do not know of any personal connection I might have to the woman, but it is possible she knew one of my parents. I see. Frowned Shizun, slightly disappointed. That told her absolutely nothing. You mentioned your parents, you wouldn't happen to be in Yuzumaki, would you? The question seemed to hurt him, as he flinched. I am of blood relation to the Yuzumaki, yes. Ah, stupid Shizune, he mentioned his family relations were rather strained at the moment. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring up any painful memories. It's fine, I need to accept them anyway. Hiding from reality isn't going to help me any. Did you have any more questions? Just one, if you don't mind. I heard that you found yourself alone and locked out of your compound. Did your family really abandon you? Even as she asked it, she regretted it. What could have possibly driven her to ask such a question when he had already shown a bad reaction to the simple mention of his family? The boy stood up and turned to leave, pausing at the flaps of the stand. It was quiet and she almost missed it, but the emptiness seemed to echo within her very soul. I don't know. He stood a moment longer before speaking in a more audible tone. Your food's going cold, you should enjoy it before it does. And with that he left into the bustling streets of Kanoha. Shizun felt like hitting her head against the counter. Alright, here we have the waitress paused, confused at her customer's disappearance and turned towards the only one in the stand. I, oh, may have asked him some questions that made him uncomfortable. Oh, so you scarred off my customer, did you? Shinobi or not, Shizun found herself terrified at the irritated waitress before her. He left his coin pouch. She pointed out weakly, only to watch as the young civilian worker casually knocked it over the counter so it fell out of sight. Really? Asked the girl. Then where is it? You aren't lying to me, are you? I'll pay for it. Oh gods this was going to empty her wallet. The bowl the girl was carrying was massive. Damn right you will. Did you want that to go? Ikaraku Aim was someone Shizune vowed to never cross again. As he sat upon the gates of Konoha and watched the sunset, Naruto couldn't believe it had been two weeks already. No, two weeks since I was released from the hospital. It's been a month. One month ago his family had vanished without warning and now, a month later, Naruto couldn't tell how he felt about it. He had been confused, scared, sad, and even angry at the thought of the two that left him. But as he spent his time finding his next meal or scavenging for some equipment to practice with, he found that such feelings really didn't help him. Perhaps he just needed to accept it, to move on, to find himself a new family, a new pack. But thoughts of his two sons still lingered within his heart and soul. 
Will I ever be free of them? Can I really cast them away as easily as they left me? His eyes were drawn to the dying light of the sun. Every sun must set, I suppose. But another thought hit him. A sun may set, but it does not disappear. Each and every star is someone's sun. Perhaps those two are simply someone else's now. It was time for him to find a new sun, a new purpose, because whatever the reason, his sons had disappeared, and there was nothing he could do about it. They might rise again one day, appearing within his life without warning, but he'd deal with that day when it made itself known. Until then, there was nothing to do but keep moving forward. With a sigh he stood, determined to find a place to sleep for the night. Once he found it, it would be time for an evening meal with his ward. Mido had become a comforting constant in this new life of his and he was grateful for it. She was a fixed point, unchanging, and that allowed him to center himself. Without her, all his days would blend together in a never-ending quest for his next meal or somewhere warm to sleep. Without her, he feared he might lose himself within this new life. Without her, he'd probably be little more than an animal at this point. Being honest with himself, Naruto didn't know what he would do. Without her, it moved slowly through the grass, twisting and turning like a snake as it got closer to its goal. It came out of the green field, stood out with its bright blue color, and struck like a lightning snake. Naruto gave a small grin as his chakra chain went through the hole in a kunai and tightly wrapped around it. With a mental order, it came back with its prize. He put the kunai in his bag and moved the chain behind him to wait. So, Mido, how did they go? You're getting better, said a voice only he could hear. But you still need a lot of practice because your chains move slowly and you can't control more than two at a time. Yeah, you're probably right, I have a long way to go. Over the past year, he had grown to like his charge, which was helped by the fact that she started teaching him the techniques of Yuzumaki Maido, the man who had kept her in prison when she was younger. It was amazing to hear what the woman had done with those chains, and he had a lot more respect for her even though he had never met her. But her simple company was more important than anything she taught. She was there all the time, always willing to help always willing to hear about his problems, always there to show him that he didn't have to be alone in this world. That didn't mean he was always alone, but he didn't run into people he knew very often, and for good reason. He tried to stay out of sight of the people of Kano Hagakure. It wasn't because he didn't like them, but because he had his own way of training. After all, if you could live as a ghost in the best shinobi village in the world, you were miles ahead of the rest. He wasn't much of a ghost to the people at the top of the village, but he might as well have been to regular people, and new Chunin. He was pretty happy about that. There was one civilian who always seemed to be able to find him, and she would bother him whenever she could. But it didn't bother him all that much. He always seemed to feel better when he was with Tatsuki. Something about how she acted always made him smile. Most of the people he came across were Shinobi. He ran into a new, who seemed to be watching him, and other ANBU, who were usually sent by the Hokage. The big monkey was giving him a lot of space, but he liked to check on him every once in a while. Naruto thought at first that it might have something to do with how close the Sarutobai head was to his mother and sister, but these days it seemed more like he was just curious. Naruto saw Uruka almost every day in class, but he only talked to him maybe once a week when they had exams. His classmates seemed to have gotten used to his strange behavior and frequent absences, so when he snuck into a seat from the window, they weren't surprised. It had taken three months, which was pretty annoying. They were going to be ninjas, for fuck's sake. Why were you surprised when the same person came through the same window to sit in the same seat for the same reason each time? If anything, they should have used it as an opportunity to try to trick him. No one had tried anything yet, which was good for him and even better for anyone who wanted to play a joke. He also saw Senju Tsunade's apprentice, Kato Shizune, a lot. He really didn't know what to think about her. She seemed like a nice person, but she didn't seem to know much about people. It made sense since she had been following Tsunade all over fire country and never staying in one place for long. Aside from her master, she probably didn't talk to very many people more than once. She also seemed very antsy, maybe even more than usual. She had been going places before, but now she was just killing time in Kano Hagakure. If he had to guess, she probably joined Tsunade to travel the world and learn as much as she could. She seemed like the kind of person who would want to do that. It must have been very sad for her to have to spend the next 10 years running from debt collectors and learning about medicine in between watching the last Senju get drunk off her ass. He actually felt sorry for the poor girl a lot. The girl's master was another problem. Sarutobai Haruzen says that she told him that she was his godmother. The old monkey wouldn't confirm or deny it. He said he didn't want to get involved, and Naruto was glad about that. So far, he had been living on his own, so he knew what to do. Haruzen said that Kushina and Tsunade knew each other, so it was possible, especially since Tsunade came back so quickly after Kushina left. 
However, he also said that Kushina had been very secretive about her family's plans since the Kyubai incident nine years ago. Haruzen then asked Naruto if he would like to meet the woman who was looking for him. Naruto politely said that he didn't want to meet her. After hearing drunk Shizune complain about the woman, he didn't want to meet her, even though she was his godmother. If she went up to him, he might be nice and talk to her, maybe even over a nice meal. But so far, all she had done was ask the Hakage to keep an eye out for him and send him her way. She made it clear that she did not want to meet with him. This felt too much like someone just doing the bare minimum to say they did something, and he wasn't going to stand for that. He didn't know what she was trying to do, but it didn't matter to him if she choked on them. He already had his own problems to deal with, and an old drunk was not going to be one of them. But if we're talking about trying to find him, it seemed like Kirinai was trying to find him. He knew what she meant. She had always done strange things around him, but she always felt bad about it afterward, as if she knew what she had done and regretted it even though she couldn't change. Something bigger must have been going on, but he didn't know what it was and probably never would. So, it was best for her to stay away from her. If she did meet with him, she would keep acting strangely and feel guilty again. It really was a vicious cycle, and since he didn't want to deal with her strange behavior, he was more than happy to help her by staying as far away from her as possible. Don't be silly, I only had a basic idea of how these chains were supposed to work. The fact that you were able to use them at all is still impressive. You just need more practice. It's easy to use a million chains in the same way, but controlling multiple chains in different ways is like getting new limbs. It's going to take some time to get used to. He could hear her giggle somewhere in the back of his mind. She teased, just think. You'll have to figure out how to use them as you go, which should be fun. Naruto sighed when he thought about it. He wasn't looking forward to doing that. The fox cheered, that's the spirit. I'm glad you find this funny. Yes, I do. So, even though we both agree you need more practice, maybe you shouldn't try to use them while you're working. I want you to get better, but this is slowing you down. He breathed out. As always, she was right. He had hoped that by using the chains to help him clear the training grounds, he would both get practice and earn enough to pay this month's rent. So far, he has only collected a dozen kunai, which might pay for today's meals. He had a lot more work to do if he wanted to pay the rent and move on to other things. Yes, you're right, I need to stop messing around. There are things to do. As his chain turned into blue light, he started taking care of the great forest or doing whatever nonsense he had told Haruzen. Those old clans were full of crap and always tried to insult each other by saying nice things about them. It was like a competition to see who could jerk the other off better, but even if you won, you just gave someone you didn't like a hand job. Really, she should have known that was a terrible plan. Naruto had been out there for a whole year, and no one knew what he was doing to stay alive. Every search she did turned up nothing, and none of the ANBU would tell her anything. The Hakage wasn't much help either, telling her to give the boy some space. He didn't need space, he needed help. More importantly, she needed to help him to make up for the fact that she had never been able to get along with him well, even though she was close to the rest of his family. Kirinai let out a sigh and sat back down on her couch. Everything about this was just a big mess. First, Tsunade was a day late. Then Naruto ended up in the hospital. Then the compound made Naruto homeless. Kushina decided to keep going on her trip. And now neither she nor Tsunade could find the boy. Why is it so hard to find the one person in Kanoha with bright red hair? To find him, something had to be done. But what? How could she find a boy who seemed so determined to stay out of sight? She couldn't say she blamed him, though. He had to hide because the world was scary. Maybe I could find a way to get him out. That wouldn't work, though. She didn't know much about him, let alone what would make him feel safe enough to leave wherever he was hiding. She could try to run into Kushina and act like she was back. But that was a terrible idea that could only end badly in many ways. There had to be a place he went often. A store, a friend's house, or... She hit herself on the head. For fuck's sake, he was going to the academy. She had been looking for the boy around Kanoha for the past year, but he would have been at the Shinobi Academy learning how to be one while she was out looking for him. So it makes sense that nothing she looked for turned up. She had never felt like such a fool before. If Anko ever learned, was all she could think. She'd never stop hearing about it from the person in charge of the snakes. She had hired the woman for a few searches, so it was likely that the woman would be angry with her. I'd rather not be on the receiving end of her snake hands. Thank you very much, she said. Well, at least she knew where to look for him now. The only thing left to do was get in touch with him. She could wait outside the building, like some of the other parents do, but he might not like that. Even less happy would he be if she tried to get him to skip class. Naruto never seemed to want to be the center of attention, and this would be a great way to give him a lot of it. He might be able to miss a day, or at least a few hours. There, in the morning, I could wait for him. 
even though it was better, something still didn't feel right. She might ask Aruka what she knows about him. Since everyone knew how close she was to his family, it made sense for her to occasionally check on his academics while his mother was away. Yeah, check on him once a year, that's fine. Well, she didn't have much else to do, and if that didn't work, she could always catch him by surprise before class. Better yet, if he walked in while she was talking to Aruka, she could pull him away, at least for a few minutes, to tell him about the plans she and Tsunade had made. He would probably be happy to hear that a room in the Senju compound was ready for him. The plan was set, she would go to the academy first thing in the morning. Everything would be all right, she yelled, again, as she watched the young blonde girl train under the hot sun. She was proud of how hard she worked, but it wasn't enough. Kushina had a hard year. Thoughts and doubts about her son's safety kept her up at night. But she couldn't go back and make sure he was okay or wrap her arms around him and tell him it was okay. She did want to. She could have given in, but she didn't. They still couldn't go back. So, she took advantage of the trip. Once more, Naruko would be trained to crazy levels for a girl her age. And when she came back, she would be ready to protect Konoha as the new leader of the Yuzumaki. Then Kushina could give Naruto, the next head of the Namikaze, all of her time and attention and she swore to the gods that she would teach her son until he was better than his father. Even though it was necessary, she would do everything she could to make up for leaving him behind. But until then, she would only think about Naruko and her training. Her basic shinobi skills were getting better and better, but this was nothing compared to what would need to be done soon. It wasn't easy to control the Kyuubai's chakra, but Naruko would have to learn how is its jinchuriki. That would take up most of this training trip. But once it was done, she could be sure that Naruko and her brother would be safe. Okay, that's enough. Come sit down and rest, he said. But the young girl didn't bother to come over. Instead, she just collapsed where she was standing in the grassy field where they were training. Kushina sighed as she walked over to her daughter and dragged her back to their small base camp. Kushina couldn't help but smile when she looked down at her daughter. She fell asleep because she was so tired from training. Just like a true Yuzumaki thought Kushina, working out until they pass out. She was so proud of her daughter that she couldn't put it into words, but her mind kept going back to her son. I haven't heard from Tsunade, but she didn't really want to do much to begin with. I guess it was too much to expect regular updates. It was a little disappointing that she hadn't heard anything about her son's health, but at the same time, no news was good news, and she was sure she'd be told if anything bad happened. I still wish I knew how his health was, but Tsunade hasn't told me what she thinks about it. That was very important and a key part of making sure he was safe. But until Tsunade told her otherwise, she would have to believe what the young doctor at the hospital told her, which was a bit scary. Chakras mature around age 12, which is why the age of graduation from the academy is so young. I have at least three years before I can be sure that my chakra has grown up properly without the Kyuubai's chakra affecting it. One year was way too long to wait, and three more would be torture, but she would get through it, if not for herself, then for her children. Even though she wanted her family to be together, she had to do what was best for everyone, even if it hurt a lot. As he took his first step on the black marble floor of his world, he felt a sense of comfort and belonging. It wasn't really his world, but he was in charge of it, so it could have been. As he walked down the path, the green light from the flickering light washed over him. There was a smell in the air that reminded him of pine trees and spices. There was also another smell that he couldn't place, which was strange. He got what he wanted out of this world, so why didn't he know what that smell was? He moved quickly into the main dining hall and raised an eyebrow when he saw that it was bigger and grander than he remembered. He had gone into a ballroom instead of a room with just a long table. He saw out of the corner of his eye that the table had been moved along one of the walls. Do you like it? He asked as Mito came down the stairs, her red dress trailing behind her. I must say I'm a little confused. I didn't know you could change anything here. When she got to him, she laughed as she put one arm through his and led him to the table. Even if you don't realize it, you've been giving me a lot of freedom lately. As long as my changes don't go against what you want, they'll stay until you take the time to change them. He looked around and noticed how bright the room was. It didn't seem to belong in this world, so it was the first thing to go. Mito pouted as the lights dimmed and the white and gold colors changed to red and black. So I guess you don't like it. You know, you could have just said something. What should you say? I love what you did to the place, he asked, pointing around the room. She hit him hard on the arm for that one, but he just smiled and turned them away from the table. What do you have in mind? She looked back at the table they were leaving behind and asked with suspicion. We're dancing, he said with a smile. A piano took the place of the table, and soft melodies filled the room. You worked so hard to make this beautiful room, I thought it would be a shame not to use it. 
We can eat first, right? We could, but I'm still trying to think of something to serve. This is mostly just to buy me some time. She smiled and raised an eyebrow. Were you lying to me when you said you would use my hard work? He laughed and said, absolutely not. He lied and said, I'm using it to buy myself some time. Mito laughed. Oh, I see. So, how about we buy you some time, HM? She turned to him and put her arms around his neck, which made them both realize how tall they were. Perhaps, Naruto began this plan wasn't very well thought out. We should probably go back to dinner. Mito frowned and said, oh, no, you're not, sir. You promised a girl a dance, and by the gods, you're going to give it to her. I don't think this will work, no matter how much I want it to. I don't feel comfortable dancing with my head between your breasts unless you have a plan. Oh, you want to take all my fun away. Okay, I guess I can change if it makes you feel better. Just keep in mind that I'm changing for you with a smile. Her face disappeared, leaving her as a 12-year-old girl. Naruto, who was tall for his age, was just a little taller than her. She smiled again and kissed his cheek in response to his curious look. Just because this seal keeps me in human form doesn't mean I can't change how I look. And why didn't you tell me this before? You get upset much more easily when I'm not being myself, so why would I ever give that up? Let's stop talking and start dancing. She moved her arms over his shoulders and around his neck again. When he didn't hesitate to put his hands on her hips, she was very happy. She gave him a smirk and said, You know, when I was younger, you seemed much more comfortable and direct. Maybe I should have used this form from the start. If you had, Naruto said as they started to move to the music, I would have thought it was your true form and thought the older you was made just to make me uncomfortable. And you don't think I can also make you feel bad in this way. She got closer to him, put her head right up to his ear, and gave it a quick lick. When he jerked away in shock, she gave him a smug smile. She pouted, I think I would have been more comfortable with your other form doing that, even though it would have made you look like a pedophile. Don't say things like that, Naruto, a pedophile is someone who likes children. I don't like children, I like you. You're still a pedophile. She laughed quickly, and he noticed that her laugh fit this form much better than when she was an adult. I'm a child right now, silly, so everything is fine, she said. You get way too much pleasure out of doing this. What can I say? I like seeing you upset, she said. It seems to be both you and Tatsuki, she said. When he mentioned the Yamanaka prostitute, her face seemed to darken for a moment, but it brightened up again before he could notice. What can I say? It's a lot of fun, and when you're all red, you look so cute. He looked around the room quickly while frowning. I wonder if it would feel the same in a more public place. She looked at him with surprise. I'll admit that when I'm alone with a beautiful woman, I get a little nervous and uncomfortable. Maybe having someone with you would make this more fun. As soon as he said it, they appeared, two dozen ghostly figures that glowed silver like the moonlight. They all gave a quick bow to the two real people in the seal, then paired up and started dancing. Mido could only stand there and be amazed. Cow, Mido, you should know by now. I own this place, so whatever I say goes. So you said you wanted people over. He gave her his own smirk, which was a lot like the ones she gave him. Indeed. Now, let us dance. He started dancing with his partner in this court of spirits by putting one hand on her hip and the other on her thin fingers. The already dim lights went out, leaving only the faint silver glow from his conjured guests, as if he had made dancing candles to surround him for the night. Mido told her later, with a smile, I didn't even know you could dance. I also didn't know that you could. This night really should have happened a long time ago. I'm kind of surprised that we didn't think of it before Mido's eyebrows rose in a soft way. Who can say that we didn't? Maybe I planned all of this so I could dance with a young man for an evening. Then I'd have to say I'm sorry you got a young boy instead. She put her head on his shoulder as he held her closer and the music slowed down. She said, you're a gentleman enough for me. Then I'm glad your plan worked out, he said with a smile I'm even happier that you caught me. Without you, Mido, life just wouldn't be the same. I'm glad we can spend time together like this. I'm glad I got such a great warden, he said. As the guests left to give the two some privacy, they were bathed in the soft light of a moon that didn't exist, and she shed a tear without anyone seeing. Such a wonderful warden. Candles in the dark room flickered and danced to the echoes of screams, but he didn't pay any attention to them. Deep in the ground, they were always there. Here, in his den, on the land he ruled, nothing bothered him, because everything that happened was because of what he wanted to happen. This was as close to being a god as anyone could get. So far, in time, that would change, but for now he was happy with his kingdom and his power. It was a nice change from the past, when everything he wanted to do was forbidden by rules, laws, 
or morals. None of that happened here. Instead, there was only success and progress. A lot of people worked together to reach the same goals. His goals, the way things should be. Another scream ripped out of the throat of its unfortunate maker. This was the price of knowledge and power. He was more than willing to take the lives of other people to pay for it. After all, what else were they good for? Was he supposed to leave them to live boring? pointless lives when he could have used them to move himself and his people forward in this cruel world. He would laugh at such a silly idea. In his dark world, the only thing that mattered was that he kept living. Everything else could be thrown away. Even the world itself could be thrown away. But there was one thing on this world, one being other than himself, that could not be thrown away. Someone who is safe because of oaths and promises made a long time ago, before he left his village to start his own. Yellow eyes moved to look at the picture on the wall. Small candles on either side of the picture made sure it could always be seen. Bright purple eyes looked back at him, and the wisdom and experience in them showed how old they were. The red crown that framed a face that had to be of noble blood stood out against the pale skin that looked like the full moon. The upper body was covered by a black robe with a red sash tied around it. A large dip in the robe showed that the pale skin went past the sternum. The brows were thin and loose, and the pale lips were set in a frown that showed they weren't interested. The whole picture made it look like a royal figure, which it was. When he looked at the painting, he smiled softly. He often called it the blood prince. Namikaze Uzumaki Naruto stared back at him. He told the painting, I've heard some interesting things. It didn't say anything. They say you've been locked out of your house and left to fend for yourself because the queen and princess went on a big adventure. He paused, as if to give the picture a chance to talk. It decided not to do it. You know what else I've heard? It's been a whole year since it happened. Can you believe it? He was quiet for a while. Even so, you seem to be doing okay for yourself. It's amazing how fast they grow. One minute they're helpless babies and the next they're living on their own. I don't think I've ever sent you a birthday gift. Your mother probably wouldn't have let you keep them, but she's not there anymore, is she? No, she's not, and unless I'm mistaken, you just turned nine. You're growing up so fast, little prince. I'm sure your father would have been proud if the fox hadn't killed him. Yes, I agree, it was a sad loss. He was a good man and very strong. You'll probably get his good looks, and I'm sure you'll be a real lady killer when you're older. You know, you'd make a great prince here in my den. I'm almost tempted to invite you to live here, but I don't think many people would like that, at least not before you claim your father's name. After that, it's your choice, but they probably wouldn't like it any better. In fact, they'd probably hate me more because of it. That's an interesting thought, that they might hate me more. I'm not sure if that's even possible, but time will tell, my little blood prince. In the meantime, I should get you a gift to make up for all the ones I've missed. Now, what would you like? Weapons, money, power, women, slaves, or a palace made of bones? Maybe before I give you this gift, I should get to know you. I have enough people in Konoha, and it wouldn't hurt to have one or two of them pay attention to you. Just wait a little longer, Naruto-kun. I'll get you something soon. Yes, he thought. Pretty soon. Orochimaru's laughter could be heard all the way down in his den. Naruto's godfather is a man named Namikaze Uzumaki. Even though her family wasn't there, she could still feel the tension that was in the air when they were. Sasuke didn't know what was going on, which was a good thing. But that didn't mean he wouldn't be affected. No, she didn't think that anyone wouldn't be affected by what was going to happen. At least, everyone in Konoha would be affected by the event that was about to happen. She was sure that nothing would be the same after the attempt, no matter how well it went or how badly. Kneeling at her table, she let her eyes wander to the window, where the last breath of fall still lingered like a lover's voice. By the time they went through with the plan, it would be winter. The cold, dead landscape would be painted with the blood of innocence and the flesh of those who wanted what wasn't theirs to take. He wouldn't stop them from trying, though. As she sat in her house and thought, many of her clan members ran around the compound to get ready. At first, only a small group met once a month in secret. Now, anyone who is old enough to lift a kunai can join almost every meeting. She didn't want this and didn't want to be a part of it, so she stayed in her home. She couldn't leave because the clan was afraid she would betray them to Kanohagakure, the village they were trying to betray by taking it over. Both of them thought it was a bad idea. They couldn't take over because the Sandame Hakage was in charge and Juria was so easy to call back. If they wanted to have any chance of success, they would have to act quickly. If they hadn't taken full control by the time Juria found out and had the toads of Maibokus in reverse summon him to the village, everyone with the Uchiha fan crest would be killed. She also wasn't going to go up to Sarutobai Haruzen, the god of Shinobi, 
and tell him that her clan was planning to kill him and take Kano Hagakure for themselves. Her eldest son seemed to be doing a well enough job of that already. And that left her, a traitor to the clan, between her husband, the one who came up with this foolish idea, and her eldest son, who was a spy for the Kano Hagakure Council and was actively working against his own family. Uchiha Makoto was not liking this in the slightest. Kushina, her best friend and probably the only person who could help her get out of this situation, had left Kanoha with her daughter on a trip, leaving her friends and family with only the vaguest idea of what was going on. It was almost as if the universe was trying to make her life even worse. Like the woman, it was. But as if that wasn't enough bad luck for Kushina, she left her son at the academy to continue his training. She expected him to live in the compound and be checked on regularly by people she knew. That was fine. It was a little strange, but not too strange for Kushina. Then it seemed like everything went wrong. Naruto was locked out of the compound, and the people who were supposed to check on him didn't know where he was or what he was doing. She was stuck in the compound and couldn't help him in any way. Though, she supposed, her being trapped in the compound mattered very little, as even if she could leave, it would be too dangerous to drag him into the mess. The child seemed to have enough problems right now without her and her family adding to them. People had stopped talking about seeing him on the street, so she thought that even if no one had taken him in, he must have found a place to live and a way to make money. She thought he should do well. If he was able to make a life for himself by the time he was nine, after having everything he owned taken away soon after his eighth birthday, then he was a very special person. She thought her friend's son was pretty cool, and a little bit envious that her friend had a son like that. But if all of this went away, which would be a miracle, she would definitely try to bring him into her family, even if it was just as a close friend. Sasuke could use some company, and it wouldn't bother her to have a third son to care for. But that was just wishful thinking, because it would never happen. But it gave her something to do to pass the time. She might go crazy if she was stuck in here for too long. She sighed deeply and went back to her tea. She frowned when she saw there was no heat. Had she been thinking so much for so long? She picked it up and took it to the kitchen, where she put it in the sink to be cleaned later. She really didn't want to do it at this time. Mikoto didn't go back to where she was sitting in the kitchen. Instead, she went into the living room and sat down on the light blue couch. She let out another sigh as she rubbed her forehead with her fingers. All of this was so annoying. I wish I knew how to fix this mess. She made noises. She didn't expect to hear back from anyone. One was given to her. Oh, yes, our master sent us because of that. Mikoto looked at the speaker as soon as she was startled. A strange picture of a man who was half white and half black was what she saw. As if it were a Venus fly trap. It looked like a green velvety mouth was trying to eat his head. In the weird world of Shinobi, she might be looking at a plant with a man's face. My name is Zetsu, and our master would be very grateful if you could help him clean up this mess. She answered cautiously and touched the kunai she always kept in her clothes. Who is this master you talk about? The man smiled, and the plants around him seemed to open their mouths wider in response. I'm sure you've heard of him, Mikoto-san. He may be your most famous ancestor. These people were so blind to the truth that it hurt. Couldn't they feel this wind of change in the air? Something big was on the way, and it was coming soon. But there they were, thousands of insects going about their daily lives as if nothing had changed. He pulled his lips into an unpleasant frown. This was supposed to be a village of Shinobi, so why didn't the regular people know anything about the Shinobi whose village they were living in? Even though the Genin didn't know what was going on, they could tell something was wrong by how tense their superiors were. Did people just not notice that the Chunin traveled in groups of at least three? Didn't they see that Jenin were being led around the village in groups of two or more, with both Jounin keeping a close eye on their surroundings, ready for the tension to break at any moment? Or ANBU's actions, which looked like a group of angry hornets swarming around, not a clear enough sign that something was wrong. No, it seems, because nothing had changed for the people on the ground. It was terrible. It drove me crazy. He could no longer take it. He turned away from the streets below and started running over buildings, nodding at each shinobi he passed to show that he knew who they were. Most of them weren't given back because the shinobi in Kano Hagakure were too busy to do such simple things. He kept going until he got to the place where he usually trained. Since there had been no Genin Team 13 for the past few years, this field was empty and a great place for him to train. And he did practice every single day. After taking off his shirt, he put it in his bag, which he would keep on him during his training. Not only did it make things harder, but it also meant that his stuff would stay where he could protect it. 
He had already lost everything, so he didn't want to start over. As he started his laps, he didn't notice the eyes on him from the trees. Shizun huffed again as she walked through the streets, trying to avoid the crowds of happy people. Why was that boy so hard to find? Last year, it was easy to find him and keep an eye on him. Had he left the village in that time? No, I didn't think that was likely. She still couldn't find him, though. She'd hear about him now and then, mostly from the shinobi in charge, but few other people seemed to see him. There were rumors that a prostitute had been seen dragging him around, but she didn't pay any attention to them. Who was the nine-year-old who went looking for a prostitute? Unless the prostitute was looking for him, of course. There were a lot of strange people in the world, but she was sure Naruto could take care of himself if something like that happened. He seemed to be getting the job done well enough. A year ago, she told Tsunade about meeting the boy at the ramen stand, and her master was not happy. As time went on, her master seemed to have become more and more worried about his health. Shizun was right there and could have brought the boy back with her, but she didn't. This made Tsunade even more angry. Shizun didn't know why her master was so interested in the boy, and Tsunade still won't tell her anything other than that she needs to find him. They didn't have any luck with that. It was almost like he knew people were looking for him and went out of his way to stay away from those who wanted to find him. But word on the street was that a certain ANBU captain seemed to talk to him often. Maybe she should tell Tsunade, since she was still looking for the ANBU who hadn't told her everything she needed to know about Kurenai's unique home. This would kill two birds with one stone, and Tsunade wouldn't be mad at her anymore. So, killing three birds at once is even better. So she put it off, fine. Sue her. Kurenai looked around nervously as she stood just outside the classroom door. This was it. She was going to see Naruto, tell him about his room in the Senju compound, and let him know she was there for whatever he needed. Don't worry, girl, you can do this. He might be a little upset, but he'll understand and be glad that these plans have been made. You can personally take him to the Senju compound, put him on a bed, and have a long talk with him about everything. He is in Yuzumaki, and Yuzumaki's always forgive. There's no way anything bad could happen. Well, in a way, it kind of already had. She had planned to get here early so she could be there when he first got there, but it took her until noon to get over her nerves and get to the academy. She might be able to catch him when they were let out for lunch. Even if she couldn't catch him before he ran away, she could ask Aruka for information and wait for Naruto to come back. If he had been going to the academy all this time, even though he had no place to live, she was sure he would go right back to class after lunch. As the sound of children running got louder, she moved to the side of the door and watched the crowd of students squeeze through the frame, keeping a sharp eye out for Naruto's messy crown of red hair. Strangely, it wasn't in the crowd of children. As she walked into the classroom, she gave a small frown and hoped he was still there. She looked around the room quickly, and it took her only a second to move her eyes to Uruka. However, she still couldn't find the reason she was there. She felt a heavy weight drop into her stomach and her chest tighten. He had to be here because there was nowhere else to look. Oh, Yuyuhi-san, can I help you with anything? Aruka's voice got her attention, and she tried to smile at the man even though she was getting worried. Yes, I just came to see how Naruto has been doing in class. I haven't heard anything about his school work in a year, so I thought I'd come check. Aruka's face showed a brief flash of suspicion, probably because it took her so long to ask about such a topic. He probably knew that reason was not the truth. Still, he looked up at the ceiling as if he were thinking and briefly looked out the window at a tree. When he turned back to her with a frown, he almost looked confused. Sorry, but who? I don't know anyone in my class who goes by the name Naruto. I think there was one on the first day, but I haven't heard anything about him since he went to the hospital. Here and I found it hard to breathe all of a sudden. All the hope she had gotten from the idea of finding him safe and ready to be cared for at the academy was shattered, leaving her with only a cold feeling in her heart. This can't be happening. She was so close to him as they walked to the Senju compound that she could almost feel the warmth of his hand. That heat was no longer a nice thought. Instead, it was an angry inferno that yelled at her for being so stupid. She thought he would have kept going, and she'd heard that he was still there, but she'd never checked. He didn't show up. She shouldn't be surprised, to be honest. He was homeless and only nine years old. Why on earth would he try to go to school? It made no sense. She thanked Aruka quietly, almost in a whisper, and walked out of the classroom like her life had been sucked out of her. She was sure that Kushina would be upset with her. She had again let Naruto down. She never saw the boy she was looking for, who was sitting in a tree right outside the classroom and shaking his head no to his teacher. She also never saw the grateful look he sent Uruka after she left. But the eyes that were watching the boy did, and they took note of what happened. Orochimaru-sama would be curious. This was getting out of hand, and Haruzen was starting to worry that the tension between the Uchiha 
and the rest of Kanoha couldn't be fixed. All the best Shinobi knew it had been growing for years, but now it was getting to be too much. Tensions were getting out of hand, but Haruzen couldn't think of a way to calm down the Uchiha in a peaceful way. Things have been peaceful so far, which is probably a miracle, but that's because one Uchiha, Itachi, is a spy within his own clan to protect Konohagakure and all of its people, including the Uchiha. Even though they were threatening the safety of his village, Haruzen really did want to make sure everyone was safe, but they wouldn't let him. It seemed like the Uchiha's pride was hard to get rid of. Itachi had made it, which was lucky, though it was likely because of his mother. Mikoto Uchiha had never been very proud. She cared much more about starting a family than about making her clan famous. It seemed to have an effect on Itachi, who started to think of everyone in Kanoha as his family and was willing to give up everything he knew to protect them. This kind of man was very rare, especially among shinobi. Now, it looked like they were going to lose him. But they couldn't do anything else. This was for the sake of Kano Hagakure no Sato and Hai no Kuni. He couldn't sacrifice everyone else for one clan, no matter how old or important they were. He could see Itachi kneeling in front of him in his ANBU gear, waiting for orders, when he looked at his desk. It hurt Haruzen to give these orders, but that was what his job required of him. We'll give them until the end of the week, Itachi. If we haven't come up with a solution by then, your mission will start. He looked at the young man with a sad frown. If it means anything, my boy, I'm really sorry this might have to happen. I get it, Hakage-sama, but we have to protect the people my clan is trying to hurt. There is no other way. With a bow, the young ANBU agent flew away with a flock of crows. Haruzen sighed. What Itachi was about to go through shouldn't have to happen to anyone. He wouldn't even wish it on his worst enemies. Not only would he have to kill his family, but he would also be labeled a traitor to protect the Uchiha's good name and sent away to be a spy in an organization of missing ninja that is growing. Haruzen thought that this world was much too cruel. He wasn't the first person to think that way, and he wouldn't be the last. Three days later, she was back at home. One lonely cup of cold tea was still in the sink, which meant that no one else had been home in that time. They had no idea I was gone. Sad as it was, she knew they were staying as far away from her as they could. Fugaku kept Sasuke from turning against the rest of the clan by making him spend his days at the academy, and his nights at his cousin's house. Her husband couldn't see that she didn't want to fight against the clan, she just didn't want to join in the takeover. It doesn't look like it. Fugaku had been spending all of his time locked up in the Holy Uchiha Shrine making plans with the other elders. Nearly three weeks had passed since she last saw him. Itachi had been there a few times, but usually to find out what his father was doing. It hurt that her son thought she didn't know what he was doing and would try to use her to spy on his father and the rest of the Uchiha clan. She went to the window and looked at the night. Strangely, no one was outside at the moment, and all the usual lanterns were hanging still in the moonlight. Even though everyone was on edge because they knew the Uchiha revolt was coming, there had never been a night so quiet before. She knew something was wrong when she saw two shadows creeping into a nearby house. Haruzen was first to move. She figured out. It didn't come as much of a shock. He was a kind old man who only wanted the best for his village. But he was also the Kami no Shinobi, and would do anything to protect it, even if it meant fighting its own people. In this case, he had no real choice but to get rid of the threat so that the rest of Konoha could stay safe. To get him to do this, Fugaku must have pushed him hard. Mikoto didn't waste any time and went straight upstairs to her room. She rummaged through her closet until she found her old shinobi gear, which she had put in the back when she stopped being a shinobi. She didn't want to waste the time she didn't have taking off her clothes, so her favorite dress quickly met one of her kunai and was thrown away. Before she left ANBU, she had been there for three months, and she was able to keep her old uniform. She quickly put it on and hoped it would distract Haruzen's men long enough for her to get to Sasuke and leave the village with him. But if she knew anything about the sand name Hakage, it would be that when he did something, he did it to the best of his ability. Most likely, the streets were full of a NBU, and the village wall was even worse. It wasn't going to be easy, but she wasn't going to let anyone take her son away. At this point, Itachi was a lost cause. He was probably killing his father right now, deep in the Uchiha Shrine, but Sasuke had no idea what was going on. She would make sure he got out of this without getting hurt. If Naruto had been involved, it might have been hard for her to get both her son and Kushina's son out of the village. Even though Naruto wasn't a Achiha, if her oldest son's mission worked, no one in the compound would live to see the morning. Mikoto put her trusted Tanto on her back and put on her old crow mask. She climbed up to the window and sat there, ready to fly off into the night. Hey, chicks, Mommy Crow is back. Since it had been so long since she had used Chakra, 
Her first burst of chakra to her legs was too much. This made her simple jump into a big bound that completely cleared the house she had planned to land on. She held back the scream that wanted to come out of her mouth because the whole thing was so funny. Mommy hasn't flown in a while. Landing in a crouch, she rolled forward and dashed over rooftops, using much less chakra than she had before. She went by 1ANBU, but they didn't seem to know who she was so she was able to pass without any trouble, which Makoto was very thankful for. Because she had been a housewife for so long, her wings had a lot of rust on them, which could be seen when she took off from her home. I really should have practiced every now and then. She wondered, Gods, I sure did have a lot of free time. I can't remember how many times I spent the whole day not knowing what to do. Even though those thoughts might not be worth much now, they kept her mind off of the fact that her family was being killed all around her. When she landed on the roof of her brother in house, Laws her heart dropped when she saw bodies all over the street below. They had already been here, calming her breathing as much as possible. She listened for any sign of life, either Achiha or ANBU. It seemed empty, but that would mean Sasuke was no, she couldn't be thinking like that, not at a time like this. Gods, no, please, not my son, not Sasuke. She silently prayed, slipping into the window and beginning her search. The top floor was empty, save the corpses of a couple on the bed. It wasn't her in-laws, and she really didn't recognize them, so there must have been some guests over. Ah, uh, that's right. Her niece was turning 15. This was probably her birthday celebration. Happy fucking birthday. Mikoto thought cynically, moving on. The downstairs was filled with even more dead partigoers, but she still couldn't find her son among them. The front yard was full of dead lanterns and tables of food that had barely been touched. Her niece, the birthday girl, was near a pile of half-opened presents. Still, no Sasuke. He wasn't here. The thought brought both relief and horror to her. She was glad to not come across his corpse, but at the same time it meant he could be anywhere. With luck he was somewhere the ANBU hadn't gotten to yet, but that meant the ANBU would be going there. She couldn't risk that kind of heat. So, if he wasn't dead already, he would be soon enough. And you will be too if you try to find him. A voice in her head reminded her. It looked like this was it. Soon there would be only three Uchiha remaining. Itachi, herself, and him. He had been right. She knew the Uchiha's attempt would be their undoing. She had believed him when he told her that, but now she really saw. Her clanmates hadn't even had a chance to try. The Sandame gave only enough leeway to ensure that no Kanoha came to harm. But the second he felt the risk was too high he had acted, taking out the problem before it could fully take root. She let a single tear make its way down her cheek, hidden by her mask. Her family was gone, everyone she had known and loved ripped from her. She was alone, without anything more than the gear she wore, and had nowhere to go. Her mind was drawn to someone in a similar situation and she knew she had to at least see him before she made her escape. God's willing, visiting with him and letting the village calm down might make her escape far more likely to be successful. If nothing else, it was worth a chance, and he deserved to know why she hadn't been there for him, even if they had never been close. She was close to his mother, and that was more than enough reason for her to look after him in her absence. If Mikoto was really honest with herself, the chance to visit someone who knew the pain she was currently feeling was one she couldn't pass up on. If anyone could understand her and help her come to accept what had happened it would be the boy who found himself locked out of his home with no possessions and no family or friends to rely on. Perhaps, they might come to comfort each other. There was something strange in the air tonight. Something within him screamed not to ignore it which was why he had taken perch upon a single-story building just outside his small apartment. The ANBU are moving strangely tonight. He noted, their usual pattern had been abandoned as they seemed to swarm on every available surface. Something was up, and he didn't like it. Watching a nearby group of them bolt away, his frown deepened. Something was happening, and it was close. It would seem as all the tension that had been building finally snapped, giving birth to this night. It's actually a rather nice night, he thought. The sky was clear of clouds and a crescent moon laughed down at the world, as if amused by the ANBU buzzing down below like a hive of angry bees. He supposed that if he were the moon he'd be amused too. There wasn't too much that happened in Konoha at night. Such action must have been a welcome change for the heavenly body. As if they had been waiting for his thoughts to wander, he was suddenly made aware of an approaching person. They made little effort to conceal themselves as they dashed towards him in the opposite direction the ANBU had just run off in. No, it was an ANBU, a woman judging by the curves of her body. It was strange, however, as he thought he had seen all the ANBU at least once. He couldn't recall ever seeing one in a crow mask. As they drew near a single hand reached up to the mask, tearing it away to reveal a face he could vaguely recognize. Ah, she's a friend of Kushina. Anachuha, I think. 
The woman's eyes were red and puffy. She had obviously been crying as she raced across the rooftops. She didn't seem hostile at all, so his kunai remained away. He was not defenseless, however, as a single chakra chain coiled up at his lower back like a thin tail. If she was going to try something, he was ready. She did indeed try something, but it was in no way harmful to him. When she had gotten within six feet she launched herself at him, wrapping two slender arms around him and burying her face into his neck, sobbing uncontrollably. Her crow mask dropped from her hands with a soft clink as she held onto his shirt with all her strength. At a loss for what to do, he rubbed small circles on her back until her sobbing had subsided. Even so, she remained clinging to him like a lifeline. Come on, tell me what's wrong her name came back to him and he quickly added it. Nikoto-san. The fact that he knew her name actually seemed to make the woman relax and through chalk sobs she managed to reply. They're gone, everyone is gone. Who's gone? My clan. Naruto couldn't hide the surprise in his eyes and didn't even try to. The Uchiha clan was gone. That was huge. But there was a reason they were gone. He doubted they just up and left the village they helped found. Something got rid of the Uchiha, and he was out here holding a Uchiha woman in his arms. Looking around to make sure nobody was watching, he knew what the only possible course of action was. Alright, come with me, we're going to go inside so you can tell me what happened, okay? The woman nodded into his neck as he stood up, pulling her with him. As he helped the emotionally drained woman into his ground floor apartment he failed to look up, and so when his apartment door was shut and locked he had no idea that a dog-masked ANBU dropped onto the spot he had been just minutes before. Having been keeping a vigilant eye on the boy, and you had seen everything, but, as he tucked away the dropped crow mask, he pretended to have seen nothing. I will continue the story in next part, till then we weave offline.